Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Faster Masters Rowing Radio, where having a rowing coach only makes you better. Following a program gives you a true pathway to becoming a confident rower who's respected by your peers. You can become the athlete you want to row with. I'm Rebecca Caro, and I am joined by Marlene Royal. Hello, Rebecca, and hello to our Faster Masters this week. It's lovely to be here and also to reflect on the fact that we're recording at a slightly different time today because we did a survey of our listeners a while back and there were a few remarks made which were utterly appropriate, which were that we should reflect our European listeners because normally when we record it's way into the night for them. So hello Europe. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) And I I totally agree with that, too, because, you know, everybody has to take turns because we have the West Coast of North America, the East Coast. We have our Europeans. We have our Australians, our New Zealands. And, you know, so we've got a lot of different time zones. And I think it's good to share the love. It certainly is. And if you're listening from Europe, um, say hi and tell us where you're listening from. Um, It's always nice to know um, who's online with us today. Now, I'm going to kick off with a little bit of um, a thank you. Our podcast supporters are the people who we almost love more than anyone else in the world because we spent probably 18 months building up this podcast, designing it, thinking through all the topics, taking feedback and improvements and stuff and figuring out what would make it good for masters to listen to. And in fact, the thing that really got us going, interestingly, was the lockdown, because that was when, in April last year, we went to a weekly podcast from having done it monthly, and suddenly it skyrocketed. And you loyal listeners who have been with us since forever, we respect, thank you, and some who make a generous monthly donation to us to help us keep the podcast going, cover our overheads. Um, It's really, really good, and we really appreciate you. If you're able to make a contribution, go to fastermastersrowing.com forward slash podcast, and donations start from one US dollar a month. And you can do a single donation and then cancel if you want. So we're really, really grateful. Hello from Bedford in the UK. I wonder if that's David. David, if you haven't given StreamYard permission to um, see your profile, you come up as a sort of, I don't know who you are. So hello, and um, yes, Bedford, small town where I have raced many, many times uh, up the Bendy River. Um, I like that, then down the Bendy River. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, they they race in, in both directions. Now, this past week, I, this is the part of the show where we talk a little bit about what we're doing more broadly to advocate for Masters Rowing. And so I'm going to kick off and firstly show you Luna Lin in Taipei, whose wonderful photograph close up of her in her bright pink single with her sun hat and her sunshades. Isn't that lovely? Cool. Very nice picture. Thanks, Luna. And I've been working this week because New Zealand's in lockdown and we are trying to reschedule the date of the North Island Masters Championships and the National Masters Championships. And I'm delighted to say that both of them have come through now. And if anyone's listening in New Zealand, go to the New Zealand Masters Facebook page or go to New Zealand Rowing website and you will find the revised dates. But I'm pretty sure that the dates that have been agreed are the 22nd they're in October yeah so Friday the 22nd through to the 24th um, is the National Masters Championships in Twizel and I very much hope that a lot of people will be able to travel down uh, and join us there and secondly the um, Legion Regatta um dates are yet to be confirmed but um again we're hoping that those are going to be available shortly um because they they depended on a cancellation on lake carapiro so anyway enough complication but please keep training yeah most important thing i know i know here in north america like head racing schedule is 
going full tilt. So let's keep our fingers crossed that everything happens as planned. So, you know, I had a good conversation with one of our customers in the UK uh, this past week when we were talking about head races that often get cancelled due to weather. And we reflected on the fact that we actually think that autumn weather is less violent than spring weather and far fewer regattas that are held before Christmas get cancelled compared with the ones that are in January to March or April. Definitely. Well, one thing that I, I, I was, I had this conversation with somebody this morning too, was in terms of weather, I mean, the one thing that in terms of climate change, I have noticed is in, here, at least in North America, in, very much increase in wind. Um, yeah. And that does tend to affect the fall regattas here that, you know, years ago, you never remember any fall regattas being canceled due to winds and storms. And sometimes there's a year when many major regattas can be canceled due to winds and storms. So that's definitely an increased increased incidence, but spring is more volatile than fall is in general, I think. Absolutely. Now it's the first week of the month and we're hoping that this time is going to be a regular on our podcast. So uh, bookmark it for those of you who find this a little more convenient. And we've also published our training plan for September for our paying subscribers. Marlene, can you run through what's in it this month? Sure. The training program has, there are three different programs in this month. Um, the first one is, is the 1K because we do have our Southern Hemisphere athletes who will have their national championships. So there are crews, or if we had FISA Masters, it would be now. But there's a 1K for the September, like our New Zealanders. Um, we have the 5K program which focuses on a head race or long distance race peak in either late October or November. And that happens to mesh with our North American rowers as well as our Southern Hemisphere rowers. And then we have a specific head of the Charles program this September. Um, and that's a pr pretty full on program right now because this is a, a major month for head of the Charles preparation. Once we cross into October, like you better be ready by the beginning of October or it ain't happening kind of thing. So September is the push month for head of the Charles. And then our, our land, the land training program is for the head race or the 1K and your, your strength training applies to that. Our performance module um, is about comfort in the boat. So it's Rebecca's interview with Troy Howell from Craftsbury, who does a really cool interview about comfort mm -hmm. the boat and how to, um, you know, get along boat better with your boat and learn how to do like super cool things that are going to help you row faster. And the rowing lifestyle is a recovery focus. So there's a video of me showing you a full body foam roller recovery sequence. Um, as well as using the little massage ball so you can take good care of yourself in between those days when you're not training hard. And our bonus module, uh, Rebecca did a review of tech tops and her recommendations for what you need to wear or not wear. Fantastic. Thank you. And I have to say, just, you know, because I'm so proud of it, the best bit, which is the bit that you forgot to mention, is the technique module where we talk about how to go row around corners and keep your boat level. And actually, the skill, I, I'm really proud of this video. I just, yeah, open my heart to everybody who's listening. It took a lot of thinking and we spent a lot of time deciding how best to teach this. And I'm really proud of it. Firstly, because we explained clearly how to do it. And secondly, we found the best drill which is really challenging. So let me be really clear. If you're a beginner, you're going to find this challenging to do in a single. Uh, you may be able to do it actually in a, in a crew boat, but it's a really good drill because it aligns really nicely with the Troy Howell interview. Comfort in the boat actually isn't just about being comfortable, as in you're sitting on something that's relaxing. It's about having confidence in how you control and move around in the boat. And that 
ability to feel relaxed when something unexpected happens a gust of wind for example since we're talking wind and knowing that you can handle a response that isn't going to create tension in your rowing is a really sign of a mature and skillful blade work athlete that technique video was fun to do also and it was it is challenging because you know how to keep the boat set going around corners that also ties in with how do you keep the boat set in a crosswind? And, and I actually, with my group lesson this morning, we were we had a straight crosswind. It was kind of a, an unusual wind on our lake for, for the direction we were going. And I thought, hmm, I learned something in this video this month. I think I'm going to like throw this out to the to the team, right? And I told them, just set set the boat with the oar that's into the wind. Just set the boat with one side. And don't worry about the other side. And like it worked. I was like, wow, this is really cool. Excellent. Glad we put that into practice. Now, today is a questions and answers uh, episode. And we've had some really nice questions. In. It's one of the fun things actually about uh, preparing for this is to see all the really diverse range of questions that, that we get asked. So here's one that's come in uh, from Jeanette Brimble. Is there a best way to carry a single? I always carry mine on my head because I like to have the weight centered and balanced. But is there any evidence suggesting it's bad for your head or neck or back to carry it on your head? Well, I always carried my boat on my head. So I think some people might not like that because it depends on their neck and their posture, obviously. Um, I historically always carried my boat on my head because if you're standing up straight with good posture, I mean, it's a very native way to carry your boat, right? And I used to find that if if it was windy, I could put one hand on a gunnel and one hand on the rigger and I could you can steer the boat a little bit if, it, if it's windy. That's one method to do it. Um, some people like to carry it, take the hull and put find well you always have to find the balance point that's the key with when you're carrying the boat by yourself if somebody else comes and says oh i'll help you and they touch the boat it's like no 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 get away please you know you're gonna mess it up but some people like to carry it um with the hull kind of cradled into your neck and then they're hold they're hold, they're doing the same thing but they're holding with the hull um I've personally never really done it that way, but I do see a lot of, especially a lot of elite athletes, they do tend to do it that way. Um, some people just carry the boat at their waist and like walk mm -hmm. it out and put it on the dock. So um, stylistically, I'm not sure that it really matters. I think, I think the, important, the important thing is that you have a good command of your boat, especially if you're gonna, if you're gonna have to steer it into wind and that you're you're pretty comfortable comfortable handling it and it may also depend what level your rack is at how you how you decide you want to carry your boat like if your boat I, is I on a really high rack you might prefer one way if you're if your boat like i know if my boat was on a bottom rack you know you have to drop it down and then you have to like roll it over on your leg and change your grip and then put it down and take it down so i think you'd have to sort of map out your path from the dock to to actually getting into the rack i don't know what would you say well i agree with that and also certainly in the places where i've rowed they've tended not to have very wide boat bays so you have to carry the boat in with the riggers vertical and so um you know i tend to when i was first getting confident sculling i was at a club called tideway scullers in london and the super cool kids could put the boat on their head bend down, pick up their skulls and walk up with everything. And I thought, oh, that's cool. Then you have to go back down for a second because it's quite, it was a little bit of a walk if, at low tide. You know, we had to go up quite a steep slope. And it's like, that's super cool. And then the other thing that I like to be able to do is to put down my skulls carefully. So what I do is I put the tip of the blade or the handle on the ground and then I lift up my right foot because I always carry them in my right hand and put and rest the shafts on my foot and then lower my foot really slowly. So it just goes down and then I just tilt it and they drop on the ground. Um, 
The only thing against carrying your single on your head is something that I found out by accident, which was extremely painful, is when you have a cap that has a button right in the middle. Yeah, that doesn't work. Uh, right. Um, but no, my, I mean, carrying it overhead is for me what I do all the time, except when it's windy. Um, if it's windy, I always carry it at waists cradled into the crook of my elbow. Mm. So a bit like you described it being on, on your shoulder. And some gunnels are kind of sharp, and the ones that have an outwards flange, that's not, not so nice to have on your shoulder. But, you know, some people don't seem to mind it. It's not for very long. Um, but the key is really to feel that you have control over the full length of the boat. You cannot see both ends if it's, you know, above your head. You have to keep your head straight. Um, and you have to just be confident that you could control the boat. And particularly if you own it, you know, it's a very precious bit of kit. So yeah. there is no best way. The key is what can you manage for your strength and the geography that you have to navigate? You know, it's a little bit like an obstacle course sometimes. Um, and secondly, how do you feel that you have your beautiful boat under control? Right. Right now with my, with my boat, I tend to, I actually tend to put the riggers vertical and I tend to rest it on this shoulder. And then mm. from down below, I hold the oarlock. So, oh, yeah. you know, I, just, you have, I take yeah. it in because that's just the, the, with the current rack that I have to get into that, that mm. seems to work best, but I'll tell you my scariest moment. Okay. Just like, this is kind of like the racing star challenge. I told you like the worst start I ever did, but scariest moment. I had my, my, it was a boat new to me, but it was my first boat. And it was a, as a, the boat, it had those like stainless steel riggers that were like, you know, that came out with the, it wasn't a wing rigger. It was more of a standard rigger. And I was on the, the dock at um, Weld Boathouse, which is the, the Radcliffe Boathouse across from Harvard. And it was December and I, and I had to, I had the boat on my head and I'm holding the two riggers. Right. And so I walked down on the dock and the docks running you know, this way, kind of east, west, and this huge gust of wind came and I'm holding the rigger bars and the bow came up vertical and came down on the other side. And I just turned and that way it went down in the water instead of coming down, smashing on the dock. And I'm holding it going, oh, my God, this I've only had this boat for a week. What's happening? This can't possibly be happening. So. That was when I started like holding one rigger and then holding the gunnel so that I could steer the boat and not holding both riggers on the same side. Well, that, that, there's a lesson. That and, was a scary and, moment. Quick <laughs> so, thinking. Yeah. I was like, no, I don't want it to hit the dock. And I turned so boom, it hit, it went into the Charles River. But it was okay. At least it was okay. That's a soft but, landing, at least. Yeah. Now, this question came from Western Australia. I row on the Swan River in Perth, Western Australia, in an eight, where the oldest member is 90 plus um, and in a beautiful wooden king single. Is your 5K training plan adaptable for our 17K head race down the Swan River? Uh, he says the event is open to two classes of boats, cock states and single skulls. Um, so that's a, what a, what a great question. And also, I think it's useful for us to talk a little bit about um, adapting programs more broadly? So the short answer is absolutely yes. And I'm going to give two examples. The first one is for a clearly older average age eight, and I'm going to hazard a guess, if your oldest member is that old, probably the average age is over 60. Your top rating for a 5K race would not be the same if your crew was in your 40s or your 50s. So be cognizant of the likely rate you will be doing during the main body of the race, whatever your age. And then take a look at the training plan and look at the category of pieces. As the categories get more intense, we put in suggested rates. They usually a range, but adjust those to reflect your boat and crew and age and capability. 
Because I also got an inquiry this week from someone who said, I coach a junior crew. Could I buy your 5K program? We're going to the head of the Charles. Actually, they wanted the head of the Charles version, but it's fundamentally the same. And use it for my juniors. And the answer I gave was this. The Faster Masters program is six sessions a week. Your juniors probably train more than that. The Faster Masters program is designed for during the weekdays for the session to be completed within one hour. During the weekends, it's, it's a little bit longer. Your juniors probably, depending on their age, but let's assume they're 17, 18, they will likely train for an hour and a quarter, an hour and a half each time they do a session. So the answer is yes, you can take the program and adapt it. But for the juniors, I would throw in more long distance endurance work to build their fitness and adjust the ratings slightly up. And then for our gentleman's eight on the Swan River, I would adjust the ratings down, but also focus instead of focusing on we always have three core sessions which you must do each week i would look closely at those sessions and maybe make an endurance session one of your core if you're only training three times a week if you're training four you'll already be doing at least one endurance but if you have the opportunity do the endurance ones for the full specified time because 17k is an extremely long way, even if you have the stream going with you um, or the tide. I think it's a slightly tidal river. Um, so those are my recommendations with regards to adjusting the program. Look to your race pace and consider the length of the uh, race that you're going to be doing. If I were going to look at a, a 17K compared to the 5K, I would say on, on the key workouts, which have the harder work, you don't need to do more than what's there. What you what you need to do is a little bit more of the endurance work, a little bit longer distance. Um, also, your your pace. If you're comparing your 5k to a 17k race, typically, for example, for a half marathon, okay, which is 21 point something, for a half marathon, is out the, the top end of cat five pace. So for your 17K, you're probably going to look at, if, say if you did, a, if you did a, your 5K trial on the water, I would say you probably are going to look at, if you look at your average split, you're probably going to look at two to three seconds slower for your, set, for your 17K. So more like your, your, what would be your category four pace, which is two seconds slower than your, your say 20 minute or 5k. So you're probably going to, you're going to be a little bit under that, um, but not a whole heck of a lot. That's excellent advice. So I hope that's helpful, Michael and best wishes. And I really hope that you can send us a photograph of this wonderful mm -hmm. sounding aid. Dynamic recovery. I've been hearing a fair bit about it these days. I know you said it was reserved for the most experienced rowers, but it is being coached locally. What is this? <laughs> this is kind of a, a hot topic. And um, <laughs> I'm going to admit, you know, uh, I don't know everything about this. So I'll give you a little bit what my take is on it. Um, I'm not going to say it's 100% right or there's not a lot more to discuss about it. Um, in the July issue of, of Rowing News, right here, Volker Nolte, um, who is one of our favorite sports scientists. He, he write, wrote an article called Swing or Coordination of Forces. And he talks about that. I mean, basically here, I'm, I'm just going to quote this. The important phase of the stroke, meaning when you put the blade in the water, requires the rower to master the coordination of various forces. It all begins with the proper approach into the full reach position. 
contrary to the old fashioned idea of slowing down into the catch position and reducing the force on the foot stretcher, we now know, this is from a biomechanical point of view, we now know that it's advantageous to reach the turning point with considerable pressure on the front part of the feet. Okay, so I think that this concept of dynamic recovery is not is the interpretation, first of all, of not slowing down. And this is my interpretation. I might not be right, but not slowing down into the entry. Okay. But what he's talking about is the coordination of the forces that the foot stretcher is loaded at this point. He said, this swift and powerful movement is similar to the counter movement jump, where a quick change of direction at the low point of an athlete's center of mass produces a higher jump than a squat jump from a still bent knee position. In a counter movement jump, the athlete reaches the bent knee position with the fully engaged leg muscles on high ground reaction forces on their feet. This larger starting forces is what increases both the jump and the height. Now, translated to rowing. Okay, this is a direct quote. Rowers need to load up the foot stretcher to start a quick and powerful blade entry. The quicker and stronger movement stems from the higher force on the feet which helps accelerate the rower's mass and increase the blade force. This does not mean that the rower should try to break the foot stretcher with massive force. Instead, they should generate a solid platform from which they can begin their next drive quickly and strongly. They need to use the inertia of their body mass into the full reach position and the preloading of their leg and trunk muscles to produce quick movements that feel fluent and light. So I think this is a really important point because it's not rushing into the top of the slide. This and and Jeanette and I we had a chance to talk recently and we were talking about this and what I expressed was this movement of quickness and loading requires a tremendous amount of skill and you've got to have a tremendous amount of blade work skill at the entry to be able to do this because it's not rush dynamic doesn't mean rushing the boat dynamic means like active fluid movement getting things ready but it also means in time and one of the things that um volker mentions in here in, in a, another part of the article is that we shouldn't confuse um checking the boat with pitching the boat. Yeah. So pitching is this. We Pulling do not off. want pitching. Yeah. You know, check it, checking checking the and watching the stern movement is a horizontal movement. Pitching is a is a bouncing movement. So I I think when you're looking at trying to perfect and it, and it's this is a very difficult transition to perfect. I mean, it's what we work on for 40 years, right? God help so, us. So <laughs> but you know looking looking at how this is being done so i uh as we were talking about it's a little bit like you need some classical education before you can start to modify so you know like let's get our classical ballet in before you start to learn tap and other things let's get our scales down on the piano before you start to play jazz so i think i would be cautious with inexperienced crews of what you're trying to teach them and and perhaps as a coach just be very clear of what you're telling them to do so that they understand about moving the boat it's not just about moving their body so you know i just think you have to be careful yeah which brings us to a great question from one of our live watchers hi hanny galal nice to see you he asks can certain drills have a negative effect if they're used with inexperienced rowers Oh, yes, for sure. So, Definitely. for example, the one that Marlene just described, if you cannot put your oar in the water at full compression before you drive off the foot stretcher and you try and do this dynamic recovery, what will happen is you will press hard on the foot stretcher, the oar won't be in the water, and you'll lose half your leg drive with the oar in the air. So, absolutely, that's a really great example. Yeah, or I mean, again, the good coaching is going to find the tool in the toolkit that's going to help 
the athlete either learn a certain skill or get get to the next level. So, you know, there there are definitely drills that are much like rowing feet out is one level of drill, but rowing feet out with square blades is another level of drill. And then rowing feet out with square blades and eyes closed is another level of drill. So just like like anything, you have to you have to grade it according to the um yeah, the, ability. The skill, yeah, and, and the ability. And a good coach will do that because, first of all, you want to build up confidence and skill. You don't want to frustrate the athlete that they're not able to do something. Totally. Um, yeah. So, and also, when we teach drills, quite often we'll do here's the basic drill and here's a more advanced version so that you can, if you're coaching or if you're practicing or organizing within your crew, you can try the basic drill a couple of times. And then when you really feel confident doing it, then move on to a more advanced version. And my general rule is that you need to do a drill three times within one outing before you begin to get the benefits. Yeah. And drills are not just to do, I mean, Sometimes one time one lady said to me, oh, I already did that drill. I don't need to do that again. I'm like, what do you mean you already did it? Do it again. I mean, it's Perfect. not like, it's like it's like skiing loops on a, on a at a ski center. Like, oh, yeah, I already did that one. I'm not going to do that one. You, you must repeat these things. You must practice. Right. You must practice. Mm -hmm. And as you get better, you learn to do it at a better level. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, appropriateness is is very, very important to be challenging and not frustrating, you know, to be challenging, move somebody to the next step. If it doesn't work, back off a little bit, do something different. Instead of square blades, quarter feather, you know, there's lots of things you can do. Totally. Different styles of rowing. This is really a discussion point that um, there, should we be open to different styles of rowing? Um, you know, you get in a crew with someone differently. Is it good to be adaptable? Or should we expect everyone to row exactly the same way that I already do? 100% be open. I mean, as a coach, I and, you know, in my background of working in camps with many, many coaches from many, many backgrounds, we don't, you know, we all agree on some very basic things, right? But how we accomplish that can be very different. And I love hearing other people talk about things because you always learn something. You always learn something and then you can put, again, put that tool in, in your toolkit. You don't have to agree on everything, but I think there's always going to be a certain fundamental things like we're looking at a certain quality of the boat. We're looking at a certain quality of blade work. How you perhaps accomplish that could, could be different, but it's it's very important to listen to what other people have to say and take that into i mean and again how you row effectively depends on your body <laughs> you know you may not be able to row that way um you may row at, listen you can row absolutely idiosyncratically and we do see that among elite athletes, they all have their little kinks, they all have their little imperfections, but they all do similar things very, very well, right? They all know how to put the blade in the water, they all know how to drive, they all know how to keep it level, they know, you know, they know how to do these things, how they sometimes get from A to B can be a little bit different. But um, I and I think coaches and athletes do themselves a disservice when they don't listen to what other people have to say, because you don't have to agree with it. You simply should know about it and then interpret it, interpret the parts that help you. I think that's a great starting point, but I'm going to disagree on, on a few of them. So mm -hmm. particularly when you're building a crew who you want to race together, starting exactly as Marlene says, listen, try, experiment, adapt. You're looking to blend. But crew boats, particularly larger boats like quads and eights, get an enormous amount of momentum and rhythm from very, very identical movements of the athletes. And you get a significant advantage if you can be more uniform. And that shows up in blade parallels. It shows up in when your body swings through the stroke. 
It shows up on when your arms come away together at the finish. So all of these things really do contribute long term. So you tend to find that within a club, people do have a similar style because there's distinct benefits if you're racing. If you're not racing, it doesn't really matter nearly so much. Um, but that's my view. And I know that certainly the coaches of the international crews down here in Australia and New Zealand set enormous store by having very, very similar physiques, but very, very similar blade work more than anything else in the boat so that everyone's parallels are the same. And if you watch a crew racing, look at the gap between their heads. The gap between the heads should be the same throughout the power phase and the recovery. And that's a really good thing to look for when you're looking for inconsistencies and whether you can get them more uniform. Oh, definitely. I was thinking of it more from a from a perspective of, of just learning, not necessarily like in a crew boat. I absolutely agree. Like it's got to be super clear. And when Adam Creek was on our racing starts challenge a few months ago, and he talked about the eight no, in, in team boats and what we're doing, like when we're in the present and this boat's got to go the fastest it can it can go then a hundred percent, like people have to know a hundred percent what everybody's supposed to do. They have to be on the same page. Um, he defined what every seat in the boat meant, what every flick of their wrist and their fingers and what everything meant. They were 100% uniform. So yes, from that side, I, I agree a hundred percent. I, I sort of interpreted the, the question as more on a just a, a learning basis in terms of being aware of different ways of approaching things. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking of it like just from a coaching, like coaching point of view, like, do I need to use this or could I use this with this person? But um, if you're trying to make big boats go faster, I think it's got to be extremely, extremely specific. Um, you still need to to just know about things. It doesn't mean you have to practice all of them. But, you know, I think in a program, if you want uniformity and people to be able to change seats, they've got to be able to like row that style of the club or, um, you know, you can't be changing your club style every week. That would be very confusing to people or your national style. But as a single scholar, you might try different techniques to see what works for you. So you've got a little bit more leeway when you're by yourself, <laughs> I think. Yeah, that's so true. I had a very long-standing disagreement with um, another professional um, about the power phase of the rowing stroke. And you can track using um, force gauges exactly how much power is delivered with the legs, the back and the arms. And there are some very nice graphs uh, which are from Valery Kleshnev um, at Bio that show a nice little curve for your legs. And just as the legs end, then the, a different curve for the backswing, which is shorter and higher, and another one for your arms. And then obviously the combination of those makes the ultimate force curve for the whole stroke. And we had a really long-standing disagreement about the difference between what he called the simultaneous style and the sequential style, because he was he believed and that the science showed that the boat went faster if you open your if you drive your legs and open your back simultaneously you get a higher peak force and the area under the curve is larger whereas i felt that you should drive your legs first and then lever your back off your legs as a more of a simul a sequential movement now we never resolved this dispute um, but I felt somewhat vindicated because when you look at the international athletes, the vast majority of them use sequential style rather than simultaneous. And if you want to see an extreme example of that, go back and look at the 1992 Barcelona Olympics and look at the Italian men's cox pair, the Abignali brothers. They do almost an entire leg drive before their back swing. And that was the Italian national style at the time. And very, very different from many other nations at the time. But it's very easy to see how differently they row compared with the other people that they're racing. Well, and, and I think it's also somewhat different for different body types. 
because like mm -hmm. I could say in my own in my own rowing when I was more collected versus like severely sequential let's put it that way I was faster so okay. but that doesn't mean that everybody is and that doesn't mean that you know again different body types different training I mean, still, I mean, there's no question that our, our legs are our stronger power. It's just a question of how deep you get into the leg drive before the, before the next components come on. And I, what, what I would advise people to look at is look at the pressure on the blade and their suspension. And if you can hold the pressure on the blade and you can hold the suspension and do that effectively for the best amount of length that you can, like you're in the money, you're going to be moving the boat. So um, you know, I think, you know, there are, there are definitely styles that are extremely much more, uh, sequential versus other ones, but it's a little bit yeah. individual. I think it's a little bit individual, but you're still looking for the same things like the longer yeah. drive power, how long can you keep the pressure on the blade? How, and how do you do that effectively? And Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But um, but yeah, it's you know you you have to experiment because I definitely rode both styles and when I changed because I also had Eastern European coaches who wrote who coached more that collected style at that time, um, mm -hmm. and it, it at that point in time it went better. Now who's to say I could go back five years later and learn how to row a different way and maybe it would have gone better too just because I knew more. I don't know. Who knows, right? Certainly, as you age and your your power, you know, diminishes, you do need to adjust your rowing stroke. That's I particularly with women. A lot of women have a very long arm draw, which is doing nothing for the boat speed. And I agree. Um, we, I agree with that totally. Um, so I've had, you know, I've had to change my technique. Um, yeah, and certainly being adaptable is a really useful broad skill for people in boats generally. I have won seat races with people because I'm better at adapting to the style that's being rowed in that boat against people who I know are stronger than me. So um, that's, you know, definitely, definitely a skill. Because if you can get in a boat with anyone and have a good row, people want to row with you. You know, as I say in the opening thing, become the rower the athlete you want to row with, you know, exactly. People, people will enjoy rowing with you if they have a good row when you're in the boat. Right. Because it is about moving the boat. It's not about how you look. Right. I mean, I wish it was. Everybody wants to look nice, but, but it is about moving, moving the boat well together with other people. So being able to, um, you know, like often if you row with an inexperienced rower, if you're the experienced one, you're better off to row behind them because you can adapt to them. They can't adapt to you as, easy, as easily as you, you can adapt to them. But, you know, you always, always go back to the basics. You know, there's style versus technique, right? And style is how things might look and blah, blah, blah. And, and technique is like, how long are you holding your drive pressure? How are you moving the boat? What's the quality of the boat move? What's the speed of the boat? What's the pattern of the boat? So I think you just always have to keep the big picture. Yeah, that reminds me of Ian Hopkins, Hoppy, who was a very skilled former international athlete and found a very strong, strong younger man, and decided they were going to do the pair at what we jokingly called Nottingham International Regatta. And basically he put, the less experienced man in the stroke seat. And Ian coached him, steered the boat, rode bow, did all the calls, and they did really well because basically he just said, you just carry on. I will fix everything else. So he held the boat balanced for them. He judged the race. He, yeah, he, he had it all in hand. And, you know, that's something that an experienced rower can do. And we did, um, we did tease him a lot about that afterwards. <laughs> that's good. But it's true, you know, it's true. And and talking about our video of keeping the boat level when cornering, I mean, that's what he was doing for, for the pair. You know, he was holding the boat level with one oar, basically, you know. So you can you can make it go faster if you don't do that, but working with someone who's less experienced in probably their first pairs race, it's a good thing to do. That brings us to the end of this week's episode. Thank you so much for joining us. We're delighted to have had 
probably our first ever listeners from South Africa. Hooray. Apologies for describing the time zone as European. I will correct that next time. First episode of the month will be at this time. And so please line that up in your diaries. And we very much hope that you'll be able to join us again. So this has been Faster Masters Rowing Radio, the show dedicated to masters athletes who want fun, fitness and confidence in their rowing. You can become a student of the sport by buying a Faster Masters program subscription today at fastermastersrowing.com forward slash join. Till next time. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jeanette, for the great questions. <laughs>